the Health Innovation Yorkshire and Humber. Um, thank you for attending uh, today's uh, webinar on familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, our speakers today are Dr. Kevin Stewart and Alia Orney. Unfortunately, Claire is unable to make it today, but Kevin has very kindly offered to cover her slides. So thank you, everyone. I'll pass uh, you over now to Dr. Kevin Stewart. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, can you have the next slide, please? So the, the talk today will be on familial hypercholesterolemia and several approaches to it. Um, I'll start by talking already about the pathophysiology and um, eventually go into the patient um, history and what to look for in, in examination. And then I'll pass it on and it will flow as follows. So next slide. So the key thing that we know is that, you know, fats and water doesn't mix. So we need a way to transport cholesterol around the body. And my cells are formed um, with proteins in the outer as well as cholesterol um, as well. So these are the hydrophilic parts and within the inside, they're the hydrophobic parts and it's housed by triglycerides, cholesterol esters and um, the vitamins, the fat soluble, fat, fat soluble vitamins A, D, E and K. Next slide. So as we've got the transport vehicle, it has to follow some transport route. And as you can see, there are three main routes. There's the exogenous route, um, the endogenous route, and the reverse cholesterol um, transporting route. Now, with the exogenous route, that's from where we get that from our food. And it's interesting to note that only animal protein and animal fats have cholesterol. Um, plants have sterols and it's not really in this system. So once it's digested and fats are absorbed into chylomicrons, they're transported um, to the liver and on the way may come across lipoprotein lipase, which would extract some triglycerides and free fatty acids, lead, leaving to the chylomicron remnants, which is absorbed by the liver. We would touch more in depth um, on the endogenous pathway, but before we go there, we'll just say that you can see that HDL cholesterol is actually going in reverse in the sense that it's taking cholesterol from the extrahepatic um, circulation and taking that back to the liver. Um, and it's therefore called our good cholesterol, helping to remove excess um, cholesterol from the periphery. Next slide. Now, focusing on where LDL comes from, we need to look at the VLDL to LDL story. And if we are fasting, the liver actually makes our VLDL. Um, and that stands for very low density lipoprotein. And if you look at the schematic, you can see that the VLDL in terms of proportion is very triglyceride rich, very similar to the chylomicron in that more than 70% um, of the molecule of the VLDL is triglycerides at the beginning. Now, if we imagine that triglycerides are people and cholesterol are also people, but they're on a bus, and <clears throat> this bus is going to be traveling around the system on this route, the triglyceride persons are going to get off first, and that would leave the cholesterol persons in at the very end. And as this bus is traveling around, it would actually start to shrink to fit the size of the passengers. So let's go. It stops at the first stop, the green L, um, lipoprotein lipase that you can see there. And as it interacts with lipoprotein lipase, some triglyceride um, people get off and free fatty acids are released to the tissues and the bus actually starts to shrink to the size of the remaining passengers. And as you can see in the IDL, which stands for intermediate density lipoprotein, it's actually now more triglycerides have left, leaving more cholesterol behind. And the same happens again as the IDL continues on the path. More triglycerides get off, and now the vehicle is shrink to the size of a car, and, and it's all cholesterol mainly left. And this smaller molecule is called our low-density lipoprotein. 
Now we know that cholesterol is very helpful in the body. It helps us make vitamin D. It helps us make hormones. It also helps us with um, cell structures. And so this cholesterol is very helpful and necessary and can go to tissues around the body. And it could also be taken back to the liver. But sometimes the small LDL can actually be implanted in the vessel intima. Next slide. And this is where the problem starts. If you see at the very bottom, the small uh, molecules, small LDL and lipoprotein A, it's these ones that are proatherogenic because they can um, go into the um, atheroma. Next slide, please. So as the small LDL enters, it can be oxidized by a reactive oxidation species on the left and eventually um, phagocytals by macrophages, which become activated and form foam cells. And these foam cells can then trigger a whole Im um, cascade of um, immunity, immune cascade, um, inflammatory response. Um, next slide. This inflammatory response then causes over time um, the buildup of um, progressive atheromatous plaque formation, which we can see actually starts in childhood and young adulthood and progresses over into our middle age, um, where atheromatous plaques can be forming. And the reason we want to reduce um, LDL is to, or excess LDL in the circulation, is to prevent this because we can see at the very end. Uh, a thrombus forming on the atheroma for, um, causing potentially vessel blockage if in the brain stroke, if in the heart myocardial infarction, if in the vessels in the legs peripheral vascular disease. Um, next slide. So here's the molecule of interest, the CAR, the, lipo, the low density lipoprotein. We can see the APO um, lipoprotein at the top um, and it's apoprotein B100, and it acts as a ligand um, specifically to help the LDL receptor recognize at the liver face. Um, next slide. So if we can remove any excess LDL cholesterol um, in the circulation that's not being taken up and used by cells, we're reducing the, the opportunity for atheromatous plaque formation. And there are three um, parts to this. There's the molecule itself, as we just looked at. There's the receptor recognizing that molecule. And there's also how the receptor is managed, if it's um, broken down to be recycled, or does it go back to the um, surface of the hepatocyte? And so anything that leads to abnormality in the formation of the um, LDL itself, the receptor itself, or increase the breakdown of receptors can actually lead to excess LDL cholesterol in the, in the circulation and hence advanced atheroma. So we're now going to go into looking at how abnormalities in these three areas can happen through genetics. Um, next slide. And we can see in, in this slide that it was discovered um, by Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein, um, you know, in their pioneering work, recognizing that the reduced clearance led to um, atherogenic formation and coronary heart disease. And as you can see, there's 2,500 um, mutations known about causing FH in, in these patients. So it's, a very high site for um, um, genetic mutations to occur. Next slide. Focusing on the APOB as the ligand, again, if that has any mutations, it can actually cause the LDL to be poorly binding to the LDL receptor. And therefore, it leads to a slower clearance of um, LDL in the circulation. And then again, more opportunity for atheromatous formation. And um, the mutation that's most common in the UK is stated here. Next slide. Lastly, um, looking at gain of function um, for the P PCSK9 molecule. So the PCSK9 molecule attaches to the LDL receptor when it's on the surface. And once endocytose flags that, 
for um, you know recycling for it to be broken down. So the more PCSK9 attached to the receptors, the more they're broken down and therefore gain of function PCSK9 uh, mutations can lead to less receptors on the surface and, and therefore more LDL cholesterol in the circulation. Next slide. So these three are the more common ones, LDL receptor mutations, ApoB and PCSK9. Next slide. So what does that mean for our blood results? It means that our LDL cholesterol will be the predominant um, lipoprotein um, elevated in, in, in our blood results. And when we look at the LDL um, being elevated is directly related to increased risk, as we can see in the 2A. This table is called the Friedrichsen classification. It just tells us that there are different patterns of cholesterol that we can see when we look at a patient's cholesterol profile. And the typical profile for FH will be seen next. Next slide. So we can see that the elevated total cholesterol and the elevated LDL cholesterol with normal HDL and triglyceride is the pattern that we would see for Friedrichsen classification 2A or suggestive strongly of FH. And then the two calculations at the bottom is just to note that in the lab, we really measure only the top three. We measure directly the total cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol and the triglycerides, and then we calculate the LDL cholesterol. In calculating the LDL cholesterol, it is limited by the triglyceride value. So if your triglyceride is above 4.5, you will not be able to use the Friedwald calculation. And that's why we're hopefully soon changing over to the Sampson equation to allow us to calculate with triglyceride values up to nine. Next slide. So this excess LDL cholesterol embedded in the artery walls um, around the body can cause symptoms. And when we see a typical blood pattern that we've just seen, and when we're seeing the patient, we're going to be asking them about, you know, symptoms. Do they get chest pain? Do they get pain on walking? Um, you know, have they had a stroke in the past? Those types of things. Um, next question. Sorry, next slide. Um, but the most important thing, because it's genetic and it's passed on in an autosomal um, dominant manner, is 50% chance of transmission. So family history is key. Um, and in this picture is just showing that if it goes from granddad to dad to son, then it can also go to the next generation, a 50-50 chance. So the key thing is family history. There are some things that can sometimes skew results um, and make you think, is it really? But, the, you know, if you're guided by the family history, you, you would um, you would do well to be more, um, you know, aware of that and, and pick up potentially more patients. Next, sli next slide. And clinically on examination, you may find, um, you know, the telltale um, signs. So corneal arcus, um, xanthelasma in the eyes and B, and C and D showing um, tendon xanthomata, with um, D specifically showing the Achilles tendon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. So hi everyone, my name is Alia. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Lovely, thank you. So I kind of currently work as advanced pharmacist in lipid clinic management um, with LTHT and I work in the with APCN. Um, today I'm going to speak about the FH pathway and I would like to discuss a few cases about FH, how to diagnose them and treat them, um, management treatment in the primary care. So I always kind of refer to the National Lipid Pathway. So I hope you all kind of um, use this kind of guidance. And it's kind of very, a lot of information that I can find on here. So I kind of focus on the um, the middle part, which is about the FH. So first thing we kind of do is making sure that we do the initial consideration. So we do the full lipid profile and we make sure that we kind of do the baseline um, assessment, making sure that we consider any kind of secondary causes of hyperlipidemia and we kind of adjust that, manage it. So 
FH is undiagnosed and undertreated worldwide. So what kind of sets the alarm bells off for me is when I look at the first box, which is the severe hyperlipidemia. So when we have triglyceride, uh, no, sorry, if we have total cholesterol levels above 7.5 and or LDL levels above 4.9 and or non-HDL above 5.9. And we check kind of personal and family um, history to confirm chronic heart disease um, below the age of 60 for the patient. And as I explained, making sure that we kind of exclude any kind of secondary causes of high hypercholesteremia or hyperlipidemia in general. So this kind of, we suspect FH, um, but we don't refer yet until we kind of fulfill the next box and making sure that we do not do Q risk score um, in these patients. So if we move on to the second box where we kind of have clinical diagnosis versus a genetic diagnosis. So in the primary care, we would like to do the clinical diagnosis by referring to the Simon Broom criteria or the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network score. Um, we tend to use the cholesterol concentration, family history and the clinical examination. Um, I tend to use the Simon Broom criteria from NICE and um, some uses the app like the MetCalc to calculate the Simon Broom criteria, which kind of brings it to a definite FH, possible or probable. But the nice one gives us as kind of highlighted in the yellow, so it's definite or possible, or it could be kind of negative FH. So when I kind of imply this um, Simon Broom criteria, so when we have the high cholesterol levels as kind of highlighted here, plus a tendon exanthoma, evidence in the patient or in the first or second degree relatives, or if the DNA-based evidence of FH. We will classify the patient as possible FH if they have these high cholesterol levels, plus um, and one, at least one of the following. So it could be family history of premature chronic heart disease below the age of 60 in first degree relatives, parents, siblings, children, or below the age of 50 in the second degree relatives, that is uncle, aunt, grandparents, um, niece, nephews. And then we kind of consider it could be kind of the family history of high cholesterol levels um, in first or second degree, that is total cholesterol above 7.5 or um, in adults or kind of as well, kind of below 16 or below um, above 6.7. This one could be kind of tricky when we do in the kind of the reviews and asking them because they might say the patient will say, oh, they had high cholesterol levels. Um, you'll be surprised some of patients know exactly the, the values of their kind of relatives or they might kind of assume that they are on a statin and that's why they kind of they have high cholesterol. So I find it kind of quite slightly kind of tricky sometimes over here. So the next one I'd like to kind of explain is about the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network. Over here, we kind of, again, we take the same kind of thing. So we look at the LDL untreated values. We look at the clinical examination. Over here, we have either the tendon exanthoma or the corneal arcus. And then we have the family medical history and the patient medical history. And it classifies it as, again, definite, probable or possible FH or unlikely. Um, I'd like to kind of explore how we kind of do the clinical examination in primary care, how I kind of do it. You might do the reviews like me over the phone. So what I kind of ask the patients if have they noticed anything abnormal in their eyes in the colored part, we're looking for kind of a, a white line around the colored part of the eye. That is for the corneal arcus and any kind of part um, kind of um, available kind of visible, sorry, by the age of 35 or kind of a full arc by the age of 50. And I have patients saying, oh, well, I have had an optician review in the last kind of three months. It could have been picked up. And if the patient has it, they will kind of report it um, if they notice it. It is quite noticeable sometimes uh, for some patients. Then about the tendon exanthoma, about the kind of around the ankles, I kind of just ask them if you notice any any kind of swelling, any any bumps or lumps, any kind of um, inflammation in the back of the, the ankles and the Achilles. And they will, if there's anything abnormal, they will kind of mention to you. And then they tend to kind of ask different kind of questions or oh, they have aches and pains. And I just explain that the buildup of the cholesterol kind of build up in the, in the tendons. And that's why we kind of have that kind of um, inflammation and in the, the buildup of kind of lumps and bumps. Um, again, in um, 
asking for the lumps and bumps in the back of the of the hands, uh, around the knuckles, on the elbows or the knees. Um, if there's anything abnormal, the patient will kind of explain. And again, it can open different kind of questions. They will say, oh, my joints are inflamed. You know, I just kind of try and explain it's a buildup of the cholesterol on the tendon. So we're looking for kind of a, um, a small kind of lumps or bumps and it's skin color, normal skin color. It's not painful. It's usually kind of mobile, so it moves kind of thing. Um, and that kind of clarifies a few more things. Um, when I'm asking the questions. Um, Exanthalisma is not the one that I, I am looking for, so it is a kind of the yellowish um, area around the eyes, but these this one is not needed in the Simon Broom criteria or in the um, Dutch scoring. Be aware, it's very important for here that the absence of these clinical signs does not exclude um, diagnosis of FH. So, this is where we kind of do the clinical diagnosis of FH. Um, the FH whales over here, this is kind of a genetic testing. Um, I, am, I recommend kind of having a play with it, kind of putting the values in these kind of boxes. In the blue boxes, it kind of gives you some more information, for example, about clinical examination or about untreated LDL. Um, it gives you that the patient, for example, if they are treated with, with lipid lowering treatment, then you kind of choose the option of which medication they own, and then it kind of gives you the calculation if they are qualified for a genetic testing or not. Um, so over here, we kind of confirm that we have clinical diagnosis of possible, probable, definite FH. So what we recommend is treating them and then refer them to lipid clinic. And I emphasize that we treat them first and we don't wait for the clinic outcome results. Um, as we can, it could take, be time consuming and, the other, you know, it's, it's very important to kind of treat them as soon as possible. And the second box on the bottom part where it says over here, there's, we refer regardless of family history, if they have total cholesterol above, of, of, um, total cholesterol above 9, LDL above 6.5 and non-HDL above 7.5 and triglyceride, fast and triglyceride above 10. Then we come to the final box of the FH where we kind of do the treatment. So if it's a primary prevention, then we kind of treat as in the pathway and um, the green part. And if it's secondary, then we kind of treat as in the kind of in the red part. So I'm not going to kind of go deeper in that. It's been explained in previous um, webinars and the target for our LDL lowering is um, more than 50% in LDL level uh, compared to baseline. A few things over here. So I come about kind of FH, FH tra treatment plan. So when we kind of um, diagnose one, so I will go into intensive education about targeting lifestyle management. So that is the healthy diet and um, stop smoking, increase in physical activity. I always refer them to healthy um, so to Hearts UK website. It's an amazing, has a lot of information about FH and means of kind of lowering cholesterol levels. We need to manage other cardiovascular risk factors like making sure that they have hypertension, diabetes is well controlled and kind of lowering any high triglyceride levels. So we, as I mentioned, that we kind of cholesterol lowering drugs should be initiated immediately at diagnosis and aim for at least 50% reduction in LDL from baseline. Um, always refer to the lipid clinic if as kind of confirmed at this possible, probable, definite. This is kind of like an answer to my kind of questions when I would need to refer to, pay, um, to lipid clinic. Then what I'd like to do with FH patients in primary care, I kind of do like annual structured review. So the structured review kind of includes what we kind of normally do. So kind of assess for any symptoms of coronary heart disease, smoking status, a fast and lipid profile we do. We'll discuss about kind of if the patient is compliant with medication um, if they have any possible side effects from the treatment. Um, Kind of any any update with the lipid treatments? Are they kind of reaching their targets and making sure that we kind of help them in lowering their LDL as low as possible to lower their risk? Um, if the targets are not achieved, then I would recommend check your kind of local guidelines to kind of in these we kind of refer them to lipid clinic. Um, and if we have high LDL levels, um, we kind of can think about kind of uh, PCSK9 treatment. So if we have LDL above 3.5, they would be eligible for uh, PCSK9 inhibitors in secondary prevention. And if it's above 
five, then in primary prevention, then they will be kind of um, eligible for these injectables. I check about kind of um, women with FH, so childbearing age women, so discuss that kind of about contraceptive and making sure that the lipid lowering treatment currently is contraindicated during conceiving or pregnancy or, or breastfeeding. So that's a kind of um, an important one to kind of consider because there's a um, high risk of potential fetal abnormalities. So I'd like to come into kind of my cases over here. So I got Mrs. B, 60 years old. And um, this is an example about family um, history of coronary artery disease before the age of 60 with cholesterol levels total cholesterol above 7.5 and LDL above 4.9. So this is her lipid profile um, levels. So this case was being referred to us and we kind of, you know, considering FH. So the one that's kind of highlighted in blue, so October 2023, lipid levels are quite on the high side. So they kind of did some kind of screen for FH. They've taken to family history, ischemic heart disease below the age of 60. Um, if we kind of imply this to the Simon Brew criteria, it's kind of classified as possible FH. And if we do it in a Dutch scoring, it comes as kind of possible as well. So we kind of treat patients, um, put them on lipid lowering treatment. This patient is primary prevention. So we put them on a Tovastatin 20. And we I, I, I kind of put it into the genetic FH Wales genetic testing. It's not recommended. We did ask if they can kind of give us some more information about clinical examination, if that's being explored. Um, at this point, we kind of refer to a lipid clinic and they can do the kind of clinical examination. Luckily, um, we've had some bloods in November 23, so end of November 23, the LDL levels has kind of dropped down. So below 50, more than 50% reduction in LDL, which they kind of achieved the targets. And the lipid clinic kind of, they put them on a waiting list and they recommended first degree relatives to do a full lipid profile check to kind of make sure that um, the other members of family are okay or kind of screened. I go to my second case, which is Mr. F, um, 35 years old. Um, this is an example for a patient who has a premature corneal arcus um, as any kind of arcus by the age of 35. So this is his full lipid profile. So the one highlighted in blue, um, high levels, isn't it? You know, the, the, it was kind of, if you have a look at the previously, they were all kind of slightly on the high levels. So they kind of um, made sure that all secondary causes kind of of hyperlipidemia is kind of excluded. The patient, when I kind of looking at his records, I can see just kind of now and then oral prednisolone due to uh, Bell's palsy. So I wonder if that's kind of contributing to the high triglyceride. Um, it being put on at over starting 40 and optimized to 80 to kind of get the targets. The patient is compliant, but the levels are kind of going up slightly. There is family history um, of premature cardiovascular event and they kind of, this is a referral from a GP who kind of confirmed there is a clinical examination of corneal arcus. So this will kind of but the patient as qualified for the genetic testing and clarified as a, um, if we put it onto the Dutch scoring, it brings it as a probable. And with the Simon Broom as well, it's a possible um, uh, FH. The, the patient is on maximum at over statin, 80, um, primary prevention over here. So we kind of recommended adding azetamide to lower the cholesterol levels further. At this point, he's not qualified for any other lipid lowering treatment. Um, we calculated LDL as explained by Dr. Stewart. Um, we, I've used the uh, Samson equation um, as the triglyceride is above 4.5. So the LDL is around 4.4 and we, rep we refer to the lipid clinic. So we kind of can see what the kind of the investigation will be. Um, with this patient, we triglyceride is above 10, uh, I would refer to the lipid clinic and they might kind of be able to do um, better quantification, that is to calculate LDL. They measure the LDL rather than calculate it, but that is a service that the NLEs we send to Newcastle and the results could be consuming. It takes about kind of three months, um, but it's not impossible to do uh, if that is needed. My next case is Mrs. M, so she's 54 years old. This is an example for, we refer, regardless of family history, if they 
total cholesterol is above 9 and LDL is above 6.5 and non-HDL above and or sorry um 7.5 now this patient has done her bloods in 2014 and then was done in 2022 when I look at the kind of the consultation she wasn't aware about the high cholesterol levels so um we've started her straight away on a tovastatin primary prevention and referred to a lipid clinic and they've done the um when they've seen her in the lipid clinic um they've kind of switched the treatment because of the high cholesterol levels they put her on rosevastatin 20 plus azetamibe and that's brought the ldl levels more than 50% reduction, so we kind of achieve in the targets. That's great. The lower the LDL and the faster we bring it down, the lower the risk of cardiovascular events. So that is our aim. And I brought this example just to show you kind of, you know, we started the treatment. Um, the patient was referred to the lipid clinic around February 23. No, sorry, February 22. And they've done the genetic testing in uh, March 22. And the results came back in July 22, confirming heterozygous uh, FH. And um, so that was kind of all confirmed. But then what they do, they do the cascade testing. So this patient has twin identical daughters, which they have the risk of 50% of having this um, genetic um, FH. The patient, the girls were 14 years of age and the patient has declined for them to be kind of um, screened and tested because of the difficulty of this age with, with, with eating habits and the being cautious about anorexia. Um, but this kind of figure over here shows the LDL cholesterol burden in individuals with or without FH and the function of the kind of initiation of statins. Um, so if you look at this diagram, the, the kind of the red um, line is the patient with FH and the green one is the patient without FH. So if we treat the patient from the early as uh, 10, 10 years of age with a low statins, it can bring the, the the figure line down to kind of as kind of a normal patient as non-FH. So it's the purple one. If we kind of um, treat later at the age of 20 with a high statin, it's kind of brings it down, but not as down as the um, as early treatment. So the key thing over here is early treatment, work with the patient, with a person to lower the LDL levels as low as possible to kind of um, lower the risk. I'll move on to my next case, um, Mrs. H. So she's 53 years of age. This is an example of patient has a history of coronary artery, coronary heart disease, um, by the age of 60 with high cholesterol levels. Um, this one, um, you can see the lipid profile. So the one highlighted in blue in um, October 22, um, she had um, a premature cardiovascular disease below the age of 60, that is stroke in 2014 and TIA 2020. She has um, been compliant with atorvastatin 80 and azetamibe. And that kind of brought the cholesterol levels kind of slightly low uh, down, but we're not achieving the targets that we want for secondary prevention. And that kind of brought us, when we did the bloods in July 23, I kind of looked at kind of screening for FH. Um, I kind of put the kind of scoring in using Simon Broom criteria and the Dutch scoring, it brings it up kind of as possible. Um, when you put it kind of for genetic testing, it kind of says it's, this patient is qualified. So th with the treatment, with the high LDL levels, kind of on the high side, 4.3, um, it gives us kind of a calculation of untreated LDL around 10.7. So it's kind of a high one. Anyway, we discussed with this patient about um, optimizing her treatment. She is qualified as she's secondary prevention. She's qualified for enclosurin, um, twice annually kind of injection that needs to be given in the surgery or which she would like to go for the PCSK9, which we refer to secondary care. And they will kind of, it's a self-administered injections every two weeks or possibly every four weeks um, that the secondary care will be kind of screen for eligibility and they will counsel her how to kind of and they will send their nurse to kind of um, educate the patient about kind of self-administration and they will arrange delivery and they will be kind of following it up and doing the monitoring. This patient opted for the inclusurin injection and if you look at the January 24, the last kind of lipid levels, that's kind of brought the LDL 
further down by 37% reduction. So it it's still not reaching the the targets that we want, but it's kind of um, kind of brought it down um, furthermore. So that's that one. Then I go to my final case is Mrs. K. And um, she is 64 years of age. This is an example of tendon exanthoma in patient or in available in the first or second degree relatives. So this patient um, in August 23. This is her lipid profile levels. Um, has a family history of high cholesterol levels with her dad and three brothers and she had secondary um, TIA in June 23 so that's secondary prevention patient and um, she's settled on pavastatin she didn't tolerate other statins so that kind of brought her cholesterol levels um, slightly kind of down from August to November so if you can see it's kind of brought it by kind of a more than 40 percent reduction and um, if I put her in the the Simon Broom criteria and the Dutch scoring, it brings it up as a kind of a possible FH. But this patient, I've kind of optimized her treatment um, and suggested to go on Enclisiran um, as she qualified for it. So when she was having the Enclisiran injection, oh, I was having the discussion with her over the phone. And I was like saying, oh, is there any lumps and bumps around the knuckles? And she mentioned there is a, a lump, a very small lump on the, on the right hand. And it's um, it, it, it comes and goes. And I'm like, oh, what is that? Then I said, well, you're coming in for the Enclisiran. I'm, I'm in the practice on that day. Um, it would be a good opportunity to do kind of um, clinical examination for you. So I kind of um, checked this kind of lump. It is... Um, normal skin color, it's mobile, it's on the tendon, it's very small, only on one hand. Um, it was very, I kind of um, confess, it was kind of very scary. The lump is there, do I ignore it? Um, or is it something serious? So I kind of sent for advice and guidance from um, Dr. Mansfield and he confirmed like, if we end down, just refer to FH. And I did ask Claire Burton and they were very helpful. And they said that kind of um, most likely this is a tendon exanthoma. And, this patient is qualified for genetic testing and it's kind of changed the score. And if you look at it over here, it's um, as a kind of a definite um, FH. So um, we referred to her. So that's that one it was an interesting one. So I'm finished. Um, I refer you back to the, the Lipid National Pathway and it's confused. It could be confusing with all these kind of cholesterol levels, but it's, it's, it's all there and it's I, I kind of nearly kind of refer to it with um, each case I kind of uh, deal with. So thank you very much. I'll pass you back again to um, Dr. Stewart. Thanks so much. I'll now present um, Claire's slides. Um, but, you know, just to say that, you know, it's a condition of high LDL cholesterol. You know that the pattern is high total cholesterol and high LDL cholesterol. So if you get a sense of that, then it's just worth looking into because um, as you go through, you would then either help the patient by confirming um, that it is or and starting treatment earlier because it's the length of exposure to the high cholesterol that is the problem um, that leads to events. Um, next slide. So it's just to say that the FH genetic service is a regional service. It's not just in Leeds, it's across um, all of Yorkshire. And these are just the, the, the numbers to refer or to give a call to, to access those services if you're not in Leeds, but within West Yorkshire. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so Alia described this very well, but just to point out that the difference really between definite and possible is the hard signs of either a tendon xanthomata, as we heard in that last case, or a genetic um, proven um, diagnosis. Next slide. And if we don't have the genetic diagnosis nor the tendon xanthoma, then it's family history, family history, family history. And that's what we're relying on here to say possible. Um, next slide. So, Claire has said that um, as we're referring to the genetic um, team for testing, um, you can do this via um, the Lipa Clinic um, through Choose and Book, and a doctor would then um, be able to triage um, and see if it can go directly to the genetic 
um, nurse for screening or if they, the patient themselves has to come through um, Lippi Clinic. Um, next slide. Um, and this is the kind of um, form that we use. And again, it, it highlights um, where um, the, the focus, the focus is. Um, we can see that family history, again, is at the top. Um, physical examination, clinical history, and then the cholesterol levels. Um, we, we put this all into the, the calculators and the equations, and this can be then followed by um, triglycerides. Now, interestingly, we can see that triglycerides is minus. It's actually taking away um, because you should really rule out secondary causes of um, hyperlipidemia, um, things like alcohol, we heard before, diabetes can hold, call, um, cause raised triglycerides. So anytime someone's HbA1c is going up, you can look at their triglycerides, and sure enough, that can also be going up as well. So as we saw in the Fredrickson classification, it's mainly LDL that's elevated along with total cholesterol. So if triglycerides are also elevated, then it may be suggesting that it might be another um, cholesterol diagnosis. And that's why the triglycerides here are, are minus. Um, next slide. So how do, does Claire get her referrals? Um, the majority of her referrals come through primary care um, and are identified at um, routine uh, women's and men's checks, like the routine health checks. Um, it could also be a family member having a cardiovascular event. You know, dad had an uh, MI suddenly, and therefore all the all of the children are being checked out, and his siblings as well. Um, sometimes other testing comes by that way as well, like lipoprotein A. It might then cause the family to be screened for lipoprotein A. And then primary care as a case finding exercise. So if you go through the clinical records of the practice and you have certain criteria in terms of age, LDL cholesterol level, you might be able to do some case finding and then um, promote those to genetic screening if they hit the criteria as described earlier. We also get um, from the cardiology clinic, um, opticians, um, sorry, opticians um, and dermatology as well. Um, next slide. So the things to, the things to consider, um, again, family history is, is king um, and family history is key. And sometimes when we request cholesterol in the community in GP, um, there, you have to be careful what you're requesting. Sometimes it's just your cholesterol and HDL, but that's not enough. We also need triglycerides in order to calculate the um, LDL cholesterol. So we recommend doing a full um, lipid profile. Also um, checking um, kidney function, liver function, um, HbA1c and thyroid function tests um, to help rule out the, the secondary causes. Um, and also um, look at their lifestyle because we found diets such as, you know, Atkins diet or ketogenic diets um, can actually um, cause patterns that look very similar to FH. So go through the alcohol history as well and, um, and measure um, BMI. Next slide. Um, we're trying to prevent at the end of the day, cardiovascular disease. So stopping smoking and um, reducing alcohol is key advice. Um, next slide. And diet and exercise as, as well. Um, we normally recommend the Mediterranean diet um, and exercise, nothing, um, ne not necessarily the gym, but, but walking. And if the patient can't walk, just keeping as active as possible. Um, it's sometimes ruling out inactivity rather than actual exercise and just trying to make the enable the patient to be as maximally active as they can. Next slide. So here's a few quick case studies. I know that we've had a few. Um, this is from Claire's perspective that we see now in um, um, genetic screening clinic. And so we'll just talk through these in, in detail. 
Um, here we have a young man, um, 23 year old male, um, with learning difficulties and hypothyroidism. And as you can see from the blood results, the total cholesterol was elevated at 8.3 millimoles and the LDL cholesterol was well above 4.9 at 7.3 millimoles per litre. However, he also had a TSH that was elevated at 12.2, um, but his free T4 was normal. So this would be subclinical hypothyroidism. His triglycerides were also elevated at 2.9. And as we saw in the previous slide, that you would take away potentially one point for that. Um, his family history, mum was said at the time to have a total cholesterol of 5.2. Um, and his maternal um, grandmother had a stroke under the age of 60, but there was no tendon xanthometer. Um, next slide. So unadjusted if you just put that data directly into the calculator um, and that's the uh, modified um, sorry the Dutch lipid criteria it scored four um, but there's the the whales um, that we saw earlier that you can adjust different factors and when that was done his score came out as six so because of that new score or the adjusted score now um, he he would he now qualified for genetic testing, and as genetic testing was recommended, and he had a probability of ten percent, this was done. Um, next slide. And it showed that he had um, on examination um, no um, confirmed signs, and so the absence of signs again does not mean he doesn't have um, familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, but mum, interestingly, on her retesting, her total cholesterol was found to be 8.4 and not 2, and her LDL cholesterol was 6.7. So that added strength to the argument that this could be um, genetic. Um, next slide. And indeed, um, here we can see the, um, the family tree. Indeed, the, the chap is the this the square um, with the, the, the black triangular um, head pointing there on the left side um, and the second row down. Um, so that was um, showing that he did test positive. When he was tested then, um, it allowed his mother to be cascade tested and she was also positive. And the blue circle, but part of the circle at the top is saying that she started treatment. And then his sister on the same level as him on, on the left and with, with the case number 30, um, she was also found to have um, familial hypercholesterolemia. And now it's for her children, um, cases four, nine and 11 to have their um, cholesterol checked. Now the numbers are not their ages, is just the, the, the number um, where they are in the case load in the family tree. So they still need to have their cholesterol checked. Um, next slide. So in summary, this um, chap was consistent with genetic um, diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. He was found to have an LDL receptor mutation as stated there. And the implications of the result was it enabled his first degree relatives um, to be cascade screening as they were now at 50% risk as it's autosomal dominant of having the same um, variant. Um, and so testing was recommended um, to, to all the relatives um, as appropriate. Um, next slide. So his progress so far is that he started on a torvastatin um, 20 um, milligrams, but as you can see, his ALT rose to 108. Now we normally think about changing statins around about 120, so he's quickly approaching 120, 108, and so he was reverted to receive a statin 10 um, milligrams daily, and as you can see, his LDL cholesterol is three. Now, what LDL level do we aim for when we're treating patients? So it depends on if they're primary prevention 
And if their primary prevention were aiming, according to NICE, for a 50% reduction initially, but then according to the European guidelines, uh, a, a level less than 2.6 millimoles per litre. And then if it's um, secondary prevention, we're aiming um, for a, a level between 1.4 to 1.8 millimoles per litre. Um, so in summary, this chap's um, mum and sister were confirmed to be um, FH as well. He's awaiting for his brother to have checked and also his nephews and niece. And um, the question about his statin, we may increase it to 20, um, depending on how he his symptoms and his um, liver function test, or we may add ezetimibe um, to this. Um, next slide. And the last case um, is a uh, is also from a young a young lady or a young patient, a 22 year old um, female. Um, she was found um, to be um, having acne. And so she went to dermatology clinic and because of Ruacutane, they asked for baseline um, lipids as per their protocol. And she was found to have a total cholesterol of 8.1 millimoles per liter and a triglyceride in the normal range um, that's below 2.3 and an LDL cholesterol above 4.9 um, at 5.6 millimoles per liter. So this pattern is screaming um, potentially FH. Um, interestingly, um, she didn't, um, her using these LFTs, thyroid function test and um, HbA1c were, were within range. And um, it's saying that she didn't meet the criteria, but I think she did. Um, and the modified Dutch lipid criteria score was also low for genetic testing at three. Um, however, it was discussed at the lipid MDT and um, the lipid MDT um, as a collective, we thought she should be tested um, for genetic testing. Next slide. So though even though her unadjusted score was three, um, based on her age, her um, untreated, uh, her LDL score was now five. So the total age adjusted score was five. So we normally trigger um, testing at a score of six, but in this case, the MDT thought, um, you know, we should we should do testing as as the LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol was in that pattern. Uh, next slide. So on examination, she had no tendon xanthomata, um, um, no corneal arcus, non-smoker, healthy, balanced diet, very active, no convincing family history. Um, you know, no real family history to talk about, actually, and blood tests were entirely normal. Um, next slide. So looking at her family tree, um, we can see here that actually she was started on treatment. Um, this is the, the blue circle at the bottom, um, and she was also diagnosed with um, familial hypercholesterolemia genetically on on testing so we're glad we tested her um, her brother was also checked um, from cascade screening and found to be positive and having um, um, fh as well um, but her parents the parents are usually um, decided by family history and also their cholesterol levels but neither parent had any real strong family history and neither parent had very high cholesterol levels. Next slide. So this was demonstrated here um, that yes, she had a genetic diagnosis, again, LDL receptor mutation, and again, allowed appropriate cascade screening. Um, so next slide. These were the results of her mum and dad. Um, again, not above the levels that you would expect. So total cholesterol 5.6 and LDL cholesterol 3.8 for mum and total for dad 6.6 .6 and LDL cholesterol 4.6. Um, no real strong family history. And so what we did in the end was actually send off cascade screening for both patients 
um, parents because we weren't um, very clear. So sometimes even at this level with cascade screening, it's not very clear. We normally just screen one patient parent if there's a family history on that side um, as it's a, an expensive test. But with this family, it was very difficult to differentiate who actually had the, the lesion. Where was it coming from? Next slide. So um, the index patient has moved out of area, so we're not able to follow up and close the case. We're still awaiting uh, mum and dad's gene results, and the brother is still in Leeds um, University. And as I said before, he also was positive for the um, LDL receptor mutation and commenced on atorvastatin 20 milligrams daily. Um, next slide. This is just to say that with all the FH diagnoses, there's now different SNOMED codes according to where the mutation is found, and that we've started attaching these SNOMED codes to the diagnosis so that we can have mm -hmm. accurate records and tracking throughout. Um, next slide. And I think that's the final slide. And um, any questions? I'd just like to say uh, thanks to you both uh, for today's webinar. Um, if anyone does have a question, oh, Eunice, would you like to leave it in the chat? Um, while that's getting typed, um, just to uh, point everyone in the direction of our uh, questionnaire, I've put it in the chat with the link. Um, and Eunice has asked, takes about two to three weeks to get lipid fractionation results back. Yeah, so if if it depends on the, the the naming of it. So I know that in mid Yorks they called their full lipid profile lipid fractionation, but in Leeds, um, our full lipid profile is called mm -hmm. full lipid pro profile, and lipid fractionation is when we send it to Newcastle for ultra centrifugation. So you remember I was talking about the size of a bus and then the size of a car and that there was a slide showing that they had different sizes, like chylomicrons were very large, um, but then the um, VLDLs were a bit smaller, all the way down to the small LDL. Ultracentrifugation spins at very high speed, separates them according to their potential density and is able to measure each layer in turn. And yes, it's more involved and it takes a bit longer to get the results back. So two to three weeks sounds about sounds about right. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to thank you both again. Um, we'll end the webinar there. If thank anyone you. does have any other questions, though, please do get in touch um, and I can forward them on. Um, and thank you. Uh, I hope to see you both soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.